Uh, my name is Tom Anderson. I'm with uh, Supernova. We provide education and tools for financial advisors and for bankers. Uh, we're going to dive in with a little bit of a presentation on debt this afternoon. These are very important slides that people want you to see, but in the interest of time, we're going to move right through them and start with my favorite story. So it's a uh, beautiful spring day in uh, 1998. Uh, I called up a, a girl and I said, hey, would you like to go out on a date? And she said, yeah. And I said, all right, well, let's go to the uh, Yankees game. And so we went to the Yankees game and we're sitting there and we just had a fabulous time. Yankees were winning. They were up 4-0 in the eighth. And so I looked at her and I said, hey, let's head out. Do you think that sounds like a good idea? And she said, yeah, let's go. So we head out, we beat traffic, and uh, come home. I'm talking to my roommate later on. He gives me a call, and he says, hey, Tom, you were at the game. How was it? And I said, it was fabulous. We had, like, the best time. It was just it was, it was a great, great game. And he said, well, yeah, it was a perfect game. And I said, you know, it was perfect. The weather was great. The food was every, Nothing about it could possibly be better. And he says, no, it was a perfect game. I said, I, I don't know what you're, understand what you're talking about. And he hangs up the phone basically in disgust and disbelief that I didn't know what I was at. So for those of you who don't know anything about baseball, uh, there have been about 200,000 baseball games, and about 25 of them have been perfect. And so in the eighth inning, I walked out on this perfect game, and it would have been polite for the person next to me to have kind of tapped me on my shoulder and said, hey, man, you're about to witness one of the greatest moments ever in baseball history. You should stick around for just a little bit. I'm here to kind of tap you on the shoulder and show that there might be a few more possibilities and ways that we can achieve even bigger results working together, managing both sides of the balance sheet. So our story begins here with Hercules. Hercules is the world's biggest cat. Uh, it turns out that this is a cross between a lion and a tiger. This is a real animal. It's called a liger, all right? I have a golden doodle. Uh, his name is Harry, after Harry Markowitz. His name will come back in here. But Harry is a combination of a poodle and a golden retriever. So you get like a smart dog and a fun dog, and it makes this cute little thing that comes together, right? What hybrid vigor is all about is it's the benefit that results when two or more agents work together to achieve something that one couldn't have achieved on its own. Now, what's that mean? Well, back in 1998, when I was in New York City, I was in investment banking, and I decided that I wanted to become a financial advisor. And so what happens is when I became an advisor, I had to figure out, well, how would I differentiate and grow my practice? Would I pick up the phone and say, hey, buy GE and sell IBM? My large cap growth fund is better than your large cap growth fund. Check out my asset allocation model. I'll give it to you and you pay me 1%. None of those stories differentiated or stood out. So when I was at the University of Chicago, I learned kind of how to think and act like a personal CFO. And I thought, you know what? People want advice on both sides of the balance sheet. See, imagine that you live in the Midwest and you have a $4 million portfolio and you're thinking you want to buy a million dollar second home down here in Phoenix. And you're saying, well, wait a second, if I have that $4 million and I take out a million dollars to buy that home, I only have $3 million that's left for me to be invested. But I want to enjoy that house now, and darn it, my friends have that house. How come they're there and I'm not? I don't feel on track for retirement, but I want to be enjoying things in my life right now. And what I found that I could say to them is, hey, keep that $4 million invested, have a million dollar house, do a mortgage of a million dollars, one million divided by five million, your net worth is still four million dollars, but let's look at how debt could help you achieve what's possible as a client. I had to figure this out managing assets and liabilities as an individual. This room is full of the experts in the industry on both sides of the balance sheet. And so what we're going to do in this presentation is look at what the power can be as these ideas come together. Now, that starts out with debt. And so I'm going to tell you the five tenets of a strategic debt philosophy. The first one is to take a holistic and not an atomistic approach to debt. You see, what happens is so many people say, I want to buy a car so I get a car loan. I want to buy a boat so I get a boat loan. I'm investing in a restaurant, so I get a restaurant loan. That's what I call atomistic thinking. 
Holistic thinking is looking at somebody's whole balance sheet and, what's, and saying, what's the most cost-effective way for this individual to borrow? That's what companies do. Companies use their whole balance sheet and say, what's the most effective way that I can borrow on any given day? Which leads us to the next tenet, which is to explore taking ideas from companies. I'm going to tell you three, and there are more that we could talk about later on. But the first one is to embrace the appropriate use of debt. How many AAA companies are there in the United States of America today? I think I heard it. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm from the Midwest. There's a weird thing. We actually interact there. So let's try throwing out a number here. How many AAA companies in the United States? Give me a random guess. I heard it. So there's one and two, right? Sometimes people who are not experts in the industry are like, I don't know, 500. It's two. There were three. One just recently was bumped, and we're down to two right now. So think about that, just to see if you're playing along. Are there more AA companies or AAA companies? More AA. Are there more, trip, more single A or double A rated? More single A rated. See, Walmart, Coca-Cola, these are not AAA companies. Could they be AAA companies? Of course they could. The CFO of Walmart doesn't say, I'm going to issue $300 million worth of bonds and see how that works out for me. They're making a proactive and strategic choice with their debt. If a company doesn't have the right debt structure, then Carl Icahn gets crabby with them, you know, comes in, buys them, lever them appropriately, and turns around and sell them. And if you take on too much debt and a crisis comes, and you go bankrupt and lose your job that way. All that a CFO is freaking out about is how much debt that company should have and how it should be structured. But people are allowed to have a very inefficient capital structure. I can't step in, buy you, lever you appropriately, and turn around and sell you. How do we learn from how companies embrace debt and apply those ideas to individuals? What else do companies do? Raise your hand if you've ever purchased an amortizing corporate bond. You see, if we think about it, 100% of all corporate debt in America is issued on an interest-only basis. But many people in this room and your clients and prospects are using amortizing debt. Why is that? Well, I can't explain why individuals amortize, but I can explain why companies do not. And just to make sure we're clear, if I buy a bond from GE or Caterpillar, you receive an interest payment every six months, but the only time you receive a principal payment comes back at call date or maturity. Why is that? Because if I'm an individual, let's say that I want to buy a $70,000 car and I put it on a four-year amortizing loan, my payment could be like $1,700 a month. What would a CFO do instead? They might say, you know what, let's put down $30,000 on that car and put $40,000 on a line of credit at uh, 3%. 3% times $40,000 is $1,200. 1,200 divided by 12 is $100 a month puts them in that same car that someone else is paying $1,700 for. Now you can say that's apples and oranges. Perfect, finance 100% of that car and the monthly payment is $200 you have full flexibility on that loan. Let's just compare it to someone who's on an amortizing loan. If he has a $1,700 a month payment, I give him a $10,000 bonus. If he pays that down, his next month's payment is exactly the same. But if he loses his job, his next month's payment is exactly the same. That's a lack of flexibility that a CFO would not sign up for. And what percentage of them? All of them. What do companies do with debt throughout time? In 1980, were interest rates relatively high or low? High. Today, are interest rates relatively high or low? Low. So with that macroeconomic phenomena, do you think that corporate debt ratios, on average, are roughly higher, lower, or the same as they were in 1980? I heard it. Higher, lower, and the same. See, what happens is some people say, higher. I'd rather borrow more money at 3% than at 12%. Other people say lower. It's after 2008, companies are much more conservative and have their tails between their legs right now. We could dork out on this for a long time, but on average and within a range, corporate debt ratios are roughly the same as they were in 1980. Now think about that for a second. Walmart and Coca-Cola, any large company that you appreciate and respect, do they have more assets or less assets than they had in 1980? They have more, and if their debt ratio is constant, what's happened to the amount of debt throughout time? Has that gone up or down? You see, companies tend to increase the amount of debt over time, holding the debt ratio constant, where people tend to try to pay down their debt as fast as they can. 
the lines look the exact opposite. Well, why is that? Well, it leads us to the next tenet of a debt philosophy, which is to understand the potential limitations that people have with respect to debt. See, look, my undergraduate degree is from Washington University, my MBA at the University of Chicago. I studied at the London School of Economics, and I spent time, uh, uh, I got my SEMA at Wharton. How many classes have I had on personal debt and debt structure? Zero. Most people are walking around and guessing on this very important topic. I'm going to prove to you today that the decisions that your clients make with respect to debt will be the single biggest determining factor in their overall rate of return. The next tenant is setting your sights on an optimal debt ratio, and then we get to staying with an open mind, asking question, and verifying what works. This isn't for everybody. We're going to spend time talking about the risks. So what is the value of debt? Well, the second book was The Value of Debt and Retirement, and we're going to borrow from those ideas and the ideas that I'm going to communicate with you today. I'm going to show you that it is a mathematical fact that debt can increase return. It is a mathematical fact that debt can reduce taxes. It is a mathematical fact, counterintuitively, that debt can actually reduce risk, not increase it. And it is a fact that you could screw up all of these ideas and destroy people's lives if you don't do it the right way. So we're going to start by talking about the math facts, then we're going to talk about the risk and how we pull all of this together. So let's dive in. First of all, there are three different types of debt. When I say that word debt, everybody thinks about oppressive debt. It's what leaps to your mind. Credit card debt running at 19%. If you have credit card debt at 19% and pay that down, you get a guaranteed return of what? 19%. I don't have any investments that offer a guaranteed return of 19%. All debt that's over an interest rate of 8 and 10% is going to be bad debt, especially in this environment. Like high interest debt, get rid of it right away. That is not what I'm talking about. Working debt can be things like a student loan if you're trying to get through school, but within the client base that we're talking about, it's going to be much more often like mortgages. Imagine I have a mortgage at 3 or 4% and my CPA says that's fully tax deductible. My after-tax cost is 2 or 3. If I pay down that mortgage, I'm getting a guaranteed return of 2 or 3%. And I'm losing all the liquidity on that. That's what might not make as much sense. The last category of debt is enriching debt. This is when you're thinking to strategically take on debt. Your business owner that's using debt to expand their operation or an investor that's saying, I want to take advantage of a private equity opportunity. It's choosing to strategically embrace debt just like companies do every day. You see, so often what happens is we start out with these high levels of debt early in life. We race to pay them down. So people obviously say with debt, what about 2008? What's interesting is I was privileged to speak on a panel with members of the Federal Reserve and we're talking about the differences between how people and companies responded to the crisis. You see, people said debt was the evil that caused 2008. I'm going to race to pay down my debt. Companies said, no way, man. I need liquidity. Think about Apple. Apple has billions and billions of dollars of cash on their balance sheet. Recently, they've been issuing billions and billions of dollars of debt. Why is that? Because the CFO is a stupid idiot? No, it's the most valuable company on planet Earth. They value the liquidity, the flexibility, and the tax benefits associated with that debt. How can we learn from those ideas? So let's dive in. Math fact. Debt can increase return. So let's start with a case study here. Jane. Jane lives in Phoenix, and she just won the lottery. Not the huge lottery. She won a million-dollar lottery. And she says, you know what? I want to buy a $500,000 house, and I want to pay cash for it, because that's what Dave and Susie told me to do. <laughs> I'm going to invest a $500,000 portfolio, and turns to the financial advisor to say, show me your best portfolio. And so this pitch process begins, and Jane's choosing from her 6% asset allocation model. 6% times $500,000 is $30,000 of income. Jane comes to me. I say, Jane, let's take a look at what might be a better scenario for you. 
I want you to buy that $500,000 house, but I'm going to put a $400,000 mortgage against it and leave a $900,000 portfolio. I talked to your CPA. They told me that this 3% mortgage I'm offering you, the after-tax cost of that is 2%. You would still have a million dollar net worth. If I have a 6% return on $900,000, that's $54,000. But I have to pay for the debt. So 2% times that 400,000 is eight grand. What's 54,000 minus 8,000? 46,000. How much more is 46,000 than 30,000? Yes, it's $16,000, I got that. But let me say it to you another way. What rate of return would Jay need in scenario A to have $45,000 of income? $45,000 is what percentage of $500,000? Nine. There are two ways to create a 9% rate of return. Way number one, buy assets and deliver a 9% rate of return. Way number two, lever a six. Are there more that pay six or more that pay nine? More that pay six. This comes into, all things being equal, a lower volatility portfolio with debt is better than a high volatility portfolio without debt. Did I make this up or steal it? I stole it. Who did I steal it from? Harry Markowitz. What did he win for this? The Nobel Prize. That's why my dog's named after him, because this is awesome. Like, let's look at this from your perspective. What's happening is, instead of it being a $500,000 relationship, I've not only changed that client's life and income, I now have 1.4 million of assets. You, uh, the, the client does, because you have the house and the portfolio. And from your perspective, you're running the liabilities and the assets and generating more income. See, look, I can't change your net worth with financing by placing this debt. But if I have that $400,000 less the 1.4, her net worth is still a million dollars. When we come over here, 6% times 900,000, 54 of income. 2% by the 400 is 8,000 of interest. 54 minus 8, 46 of income. If Jane wakes up and hates my ideas, what can she do? Pay it off. That is what happens. If you don't like my idea, pay it off. This is a game changer in terms of accomplishing her goals. Now the question we're going to have to come back to is does she need to have this risk? And that's what we're going to look at uh, when we look at the risk component. But first we have to talk about taxes. So here's the uh, Webster's. I told you the story in the beginning when I was trying to differentiate myself as a financial advisor how I would use debt to help people accomplish their objectives and differentiate myself and stand out. Now, some of you are familiar with this and some of you aren't. There's a fine line between credibility and hubris. But I was recognized as being one of the 40 largest producers in the industry under 40 years old. My team did about six million and my production was about three million. It was comprised of 75 families that were paying me about $30,000 a year in fees. Most of those clients had a net worth between three and $10 million. I don't do anything that's outside of that space. I'm trying to figure out how I can be a personal CFO to this market segment, to a narrow group of people. And let's look at the Websters and how I'd intercept them. Now, if you have $5 million, what are some of your top concerns? Am I going to have enough return? Am I going to run out of money? And what's the other major concern of the Websters? Taxes. So what if I say this? So they live in the Midwest, and they have a million-dollar home, and they have a million-dollar home down here. They have a $2 million taxable portfolio and a $2 million retirement account. Six million of assets, 500,000 of debt, five and a half million dollar net worth. We would all love to have this client. Well, let's look at the Webster's expenses for a quick second. They give $20,000 a year to charity, their church, United Way, and other organizations that they support. $20,000 in property taxes. 10,000 in mortgage interest. This was a little bit of a lower rate environment from this slide, but if the interest goes up, my slide only becomes better, which is crazy. Professional fees of $30,000. What's that fee? My fee, because these are great ideas. So wait till you see how this goes. $80,000 of expenses. Well, what about their income? They're taking out $80,000 a year from their IRA. A $2 million IRA at a 4% distribution would be $80,000 coming out of that IRA. 
So often, people guess about how much you come Well, we took out money last time from the IRA. This time, let's take it out from the taxable account. It doesn't make any sense. There's an optimal amount of ordinary income that you can create for clients, and I'm showing you how that comes together here. Outside of the RMD, I'm con your pension, Social Security, and RMD are the only things I can't control. Every other aspect of your taxes, I control when you are retired. 80,000 comes out, 20,000 of interest, and 20,000 of dividends. Let's say that $2 million portfolio is split. 1 million in the S&P 500 at a 2% yield, and 1 million in treasuries at 2%. That would be this scenario. Social Security of 20,000, long-term capital gains of 20,000. I'm the one who triggered those. 160,000 of income coming into this client. So what are the tax consequences of this? Well, we run it through our handy-dandy TurboTax estimator. It captures the phase out of Social Security, and the Websters are paying $4,000 a year in taxes. And we say, how is that possible? Because the tax code is ridiculous. My book has 60,000 words in it. The tax code has 4 million. You create something that complicated, you should arbitrage it. This is a, I'm honored to be here. My next big event is next week in New York where I'm the keynote speaker at the Institute for Private Investors. I do this same slide when you have $150 million, show how you pay less than $30,000 a year in taxes. If your clients are paying taxes and their net worth is more than $5 million, they're choosing to do so. This is very powerful. I'm going to show you now how we can create more income because that 160,000 of income with 5 million, they're saying, you know what? I don't have enough income. I want more. Let's turn back to that $2 million portfolio. If I set up a line of credit against it, most people create income from a portfolio by selling, right? You tell me I can take a 4% distribution. So if I have a 2% dividend yield, where are you getting the other two? Most financial advisors sell from that portfolio. That is how most income is generated in portfolios. People sell down. If I sell, I have a guaranteed future return of zero on that asset. That's also a mathematical proof. If I no longer own it, I can't have a return on it. Is it possible that I could borrow? Sure, if you had a $2 million portfolio and you borrowed $80,000, what are the tax consequences on that $80,000 loan? There are no tax consequences. $80,000 plus this 160 is 240. 240 divided by 12 is $20,000 a month of tax-free income on a $5 million portfolio. Normally the room goes crazy when I tell this story. It's a lot to process. Did I make this story up or steal it? I stole it. You see there's a company that's very successful. Their name is Northwestern Mutual. And they tell a story, put your money into my variable universal life insurance policy where your money grows tax-free and comes out tax-free in the form of a loan. And when you die, the death benefit pays off the loan and the balance goes on to your heirs. Is their product relatively cheap or expensive? Stunningly expensive. They charge an interest rate like 6, 7, and 8% on that. Your rates start at like 4 and go down from there, right, for your high net worth clients. Their product, 70% of their balance sheet is invested in one asset class, long-term bonds. They pound their chest saying I've averaged an 8% rate of return for the past 30 years. If I put 70% of my portfolio in long-term bonds paying me 2 can I average 8 for the next 30 years? Yes, you can if the S&P averages 20% a year forever. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You have the world of investment options from your financial advisors and bankers working together to create a better and more competitive solution. Risk. I say debt, you think risk. It could be. It depends. You see, what happens is I will bet that your clients have a distribution that looks roughly like this. One third of your clients likely do not need the investment assets that they have. What do you mean by that? Well, if I have uh, uh, a pension from a, a great employer in your hometown, I guess you know, Honeywell is here, so let's say I have a Honeywell pension, 
and I have social security and I own my house outright and I built up a million dollar IRA, maybe I don't actually use that. Like a lot of our high net worth clients just don't, we say, spend the money and they're like, I won't spend the money and you're like, that's how they do, money just keeps growing. I'm gonna mathematically show you something really intuitive. They don't need debt, right? They don't need debt. But there's another group of people that need a four, five, or 6% return in retirement. These are people who are kind of retiring on the edge. It'd be nice to have a little bit more, and they're trying to balance a lot of their needs, wants, goals, and objectives throughout their life. Does debt add value? We have to test this. We as financial advisors have often said, you can take out a four, five, or 6% distribution. It goes back to the Trinity study. If you aren't familiar with it, that's where this, all foundations and endowments use a four to 5% distribution rate. And people like to go back and test this. And you go to SEMA conferences, and where does this come from? And now, can we still continue at that rate? If I had debt, will it add value or destroy value? And what if I need a higher distribution? Some of our clients retire before we wish they would have. They needed to have more assets, and you say, you can't have a 7 or 8 or 9% return. I need you to hit the brakes, but they don't, and they keep spending that money. This is a study that was done. Well, before I show you the study, we need to refresh on basic math. I'm sure that you already know this, but it is an important reminder. Let me show you something. 3 times 2 times 4 equals 24. 3 times 4 times 2 also equals 24. It's magic. <laughs> Any way that you multiply numbers, you get to the same end result. If somebody is young and accumulating assets and say they don't care about risk, I'm, I'm talking about that in my next book. It actually is not a very good argument. But mathematically, it is true. Any way you multiply numbers, you do get to the same end result. So you can't argue a whole lot. But when you are coming into retirement, what matters more than anything is your sequence of returns. Because what happens is, if I introduce one number, 3 times 2 times 4 minus 2 is 22. Those same numbers in a different order, 3 times 2 minus 2 times 4 is 16. We know this. Your client that retired in 2007 came into one environment when their portfolio was devastated. And your client that retired in 2009, if they had enough assets then, is having a dream retirement. The sequence of returns matters in retirement. Risk is an equal determining factor, if not more, in your terminal net worth than return. So what about debt? Does it add value? Well, we partnered with Washington University in St. Louis, and what we said is, let's take the traditional asset allocation models, and I hate traditional asset allocation models, so we're going to talk about that later. But this is what people like to talk about, so we're going to talk about it. And we said, if you have a 75-25 stock and bond portfolio, and you test it on every rolling 30-year period, a 3% distribution tests with 100% confidence. That's why people safely say you can spend 3%. It tests very well looking backward. At 4%, it tests with 95% confidence. A 50-50 portfolio over 30 years with no debt is 100% confidence, at a 4% is 87, and at 5% is 56. What happens is financial advisors used to use this slide to say, hey, if you need a 5% rate of return, you should buy more stocks. Basically, you need more equities, you need more risk in your portfolio. Now, are equities risky? Yes, they are risky, they're very risky. They go down a lot. I know it hasn't been that way for eight years. Trust me, there'll be a time they're gonna go down and we're gonna talk about that. Debt is risky as well. But faced with risk, I wanna take the least risky risk possible. We all know the saying, it takes money to make money. The larger base of assets you have, the lower your probability of running out of money. This is a levered portfolio, 30%, embracing an optimal debt strategy. The confidence going from 56 to 77%. That's a 50% increase in confidence that the client will not run out of money by embracing debt. Now, again, the best room in all of financial services to truly embrace and understand this slide is if you have a financial advisor working with a banker that understand that based on the needs and goals you're telling me, I understand you don't want risk, but embracing some strategic debt 
the right type of debt, the right way, will actually increase the odds that you will not run out of money. Now, I'm not saying that anybody should do this, but stocks and bonds actually have a much more positive correlation than what most people think. In asset class, in asset allocation strategy, it's not the number of assets that are in a portfolio that matter, it's the correlation between those assets that actually determine the risk over time. And I'm just giving you an example. If you had a 60-40 stock and gold portfolio levered at a 30% debt ratio or 50% total debt, it tests at a 7% inflation adjusted distribution rate at 97%. 97%, why is that happening? Because in the 1970s when interest rates were rising and stocks were getting crushed and bonds were getting crushed, gold soared. And then from 80 to 2000, what happened was stocks were doing great and bonds were doing great and gold just went straight down. And then from 2000 to 2012, gold went straight up and stocks were down and sideways. And then recently stocks have been doing great and gold's been doing not so great until recently. It sounds like that just cancels out, but that yin and yang actually has a lower volatility that increases the odds you won't run out. Do not go out and buy a 60-40 lever portfolio of stocks and gold. My point is that it's, lever it's the correlation combined with the debt that are the biggest determining factors and the probability that your clients won't run out of money. You see, when you think about your goals-based process, financial advisors are always focused on this, the goals and the risks of clients. I want to achieve this, these are the risks associated with it, and I come into the asset allocation. Bankers traditionally are playing this tug of war between needs and wants. I want a boat. Oh, I have a loan that I can give you for that boat. I need to expand my business. Oh, I happen to be here to provide that loan. Banks, or bankers so often traditionally are looking for product placement to be there at that time of need or want. And advisors are trying to balance this goals and risks. And rather than these worlds be separated, it is not actually the future. It is all of historic portfolio theory. Whether or not you're passionate about Markowitz or Tobin or Sharp, who all have Nobel Prizes as well, or Modigliani Miller, which is the optimal corporate capital structure, every Nobel Prize in economics is around embracing this as an interconnected ecosystem. This is the power of both a financial advisor and a banker working together to help balance these objectives for clients. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? This is uh, in the year 2008. I had an office in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and in Chicago. The sixth worst natural disaster in the history of the United States of America happened in Cedar Rapids when the Cedar River leapt out of its riverbanks and hit with a flood. This is me showing up sight unseen taking a picture. The desk is gone, the computer's gone, the chair's gone, it looks like a like a hurricane or tornado is what people guess most often. When something like that happens, how fast do you need money? You need it instantly. You see, insurance was wonderful for me, but insurance didn't say, Tom, this situation stinks. Here's $200,000, spend what you need and send back the rest, right? I needed money right away. If you did not have a line of credit proactively set up for me, you might have found me calling you with my life upside down in the middle of 2008 saying, I need money, and your only choice to me would be what? Sell. You're going to force me to liquidate my portfolio in 2008 when I'm in crisis? That, my friends, is the compliance problem. You see, whether or not your clients need to have debt, we talked about that. That's a function of their goals. But all of your clients need liquidity. Because disaster can strike any of us at any given point in time. You need to be running offense and defense in your clients' lives to truly make a difference. Are there risks? There's a lot of them. We're going to talk about a couple of big ones here. Interest rates. So often people say to me, ah, this value of debt story. It's because interest rates are low and stocks are doing great. No, it is not. Interest rates are just a function of the economy at any given point in time. They're never good or bad. So let me just give you a really quick example. In 1980, does anybody remember roughly where mortgage rates were? Give me a mortgage number. 
I got a lot of great numbers. So I have 13 was here, somewhere as high as like 18 is back there. Um, if you think about those 12, 13, 14, 15% mortgages, we all remember high numbers. I ended up going to college off of a, a cat bond, as I think what it was called at the time, that had a 21% rate on it, right? It used to have money markets at 19%. See, if I have a mortgage at 12 and I'm in a CD at 17, I'm capturing a spread, right? That's a higher rate. If I'm in a mortgage at 4% and my cash is paying me zero, I actually have a negative spread. You see, it can actually be harder to capture a spread in a low interest rate environment than it is in a high interest rate environment. We're going to talk about things that could happen to interest rates, but it's not the whole question, if you think back to Jane, if she's borrowing at 2%, what return does she need on her portfolio for my ideas to be a good idea? Well, let's talk, I, I like three, right? So when I first answered this, I actually said four, five, or 6%. If I'm taking risk, I want to capture a spread. I was talking to a CFA and he said to me, actually, Tom, if you knew for a fact you were getting a two and you had a two, you'd take an even thing. The CFO of a publicly traded company is sitting there, we're all having a beer, and these are the things that I guess we talk about, and he says, you're all stupid idiots. You take a negative spread. He's actually willing to be at zero on his cash and have that 2% because he values the liquidity. What percentage of companies do that? All of them. But over time, of course, you want to capture a spread. What else happens? Fixed versus uh, floating rates. This is one of the most common questions. So I'm a debt guy. And I was uh, walking around downtown Chicago, and this uh, guy who's, uh, he's actually studying to do, he does uh, heart transplants at Northwestern. So he's a brilliant physician. Uh, he travels around and is, a, is an expert heart transplant person. So he not only knows everything about medicine, but he knows everything about, you know, finance, economics as well, right? Because if you work with doctors, they know that they know everything. So... <laughs> So he comes up to me and he basically chest bumps me and he's like, Tom, I just got a million dollar mortgage at four and a half percent. It's a jumbo loan and they're not doing these right now. And I said, uh, and it was a 30 year fixed loan. And I said, well, that's, 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 a, that's great. You should be very proud. And he's like, I am proud, he's proud of his loan. And I said, I think that you're, uh, you told me you're going to move to the suburbs. Winnetka is a suburb of Chicago. I'm going to move to the suburbs in about five years. I was talking to your wife, and she told me that you're moving in about three. So I'm going to guess it's closer to three than five years that he's in this property, right? But who knows? When you're in a 30-year fixed loan, did you protect interest rates for 30 years? You did not. You protect interest rates for the length of time that you own that property. See, if instead he would have been on a 3% five-year loan, he would have saved 1.5% times that million dollars. Had he intercepted me, he'd save $15,000 a year before going out and shopping the best 30-year fixed mortgage. Does this happen often? Every single day. Your clients make these decisions independently, but that's where you ought to be thinking about how you can add value and getting them into the best debt product for their needs. What about the portfolio? Well, a lot of times people like to say to me, Tom, what do you think about the market? I hate talking about the market, and I don't know what direction the market's going, and I don't understand any reason to talk about it, because it, you can't predict these things. That's, uh, Fama's Nobel Prize was on that as well. Maybe Schiller, uh, who said, buy low and sell high. Uh, right now, things are trading near high prices. But let's jump out of that, and if you said to me, how do I think things are, are in the world? I would actually uh, jot this down on a cocktail napkin for you. This is the formula for GDP. If any of you are really into economics, I know it's why, and you can't do that right away, but it's easier for people to understand. It's consumption plus investment plus government plus exports minus imports. I want you to remember the year 2000. The United States had about $5.7 trillion worth of debt we were running a little bit of a surplus. If you remember, money market rates were around 6%. You could get like 6% on a CD. You remember these days? Okay, I want you to imagine that I take you and I send you to the moon and you come back in the year 2016 and you come right up here on stage and you say, hey, Tom, what's happening? I say, not much, and we hug and we're hanging out. And you say, hey, you have to have all that debt paid off by now. We were so worried about it back in the year uh, 2000. Huh, what's, tell me how that, uh, update me on this. I'd say, well, 
actually, it turns out that it, uh, it went up a little bit. Up? Well, that's kind of crazy. Uh, that's not what I was expecting to, to happen. How much could it have gone up? It, uh, it tripled. <laughs> Wait a second. You tripled all of the debt from the past, like all the debt we had in a 200-year period, you tripled in 16 years? Yeah. Well, you must have a plan to pay off that debt at some point in time. No, actually, uh, we're running a deficit now, and no party in Congress has a plan to balance our budget ever again in the future of our republic. <laughs> so then you would say, well, what the heck happened to interest rates? Because you would think that interest rates went up, and instead they went down. And so you'd say, what world did it come back to? I'd say, I don't know. We'll just stick our head in the sands and pretend like it's not happening. It's what everybody else is doing. <laughs> of the government, when the government tells you that they have $20 trillion of debt, it's like 19.5 today, uh, if you were the CFO of a publicly traded company and you reported that as your debt number, does anyone here know where you would be? I heard it. Jail is the right answer. Uh, <laughs> the United States government uses an illegal accounting method. We call it investor fraud for understating the liabilities if you use that same method that we do. So a senator said, hey, if we send people to jail for this accounting method, shouldn't we have to account the same way? That measure failed. On the ill... <laughs> I can't make these things up. On the illegal accounting method, uh, what happens is the government likes to say that $8 trillion of it doesn't count. And the reason it doesn't count is if I promise a postal service worker a pension and I invest that money in government bonds, I say, I guess that evens out. I think the postal service worker thinks they're getting a pension, but let's throw all of that out of the equation too. On the $12 trillion, which is an illegal accounting system not counting all of those other liabilities, let's do a crazy test, okay? With interest rates at generational lows, you'd think the government is borrowing long-term. Instead, all of their borrowing is short. In fact, the government's average cost of borrowing is 2%. If interest rates go from 2% to 6%, they increase by 4% on $12 trillion. What's 4% times $12 trillion? You're like, oh, I know there'd be so much math today. $480 billion. What this means is that if interest rates go up, government would have to cut expenditures by $480 billion a year just to stay even. Is that possible? It is not. David Wessel's book, Inside the Red Ink, fire all of them, all of the TSA people that I saw coming here, all of the courts, all of the military, fire, fire all of them and you don't save $480 million. The only way you can solve it is by increasing taxes and by reducing transfer payments. Transfer payments are Medicare and Social Security. Those manifest themselves in consumption. And if I increase your taxes, does your consumption go up or down? It goes down. Watch this. Open up your wallet, give me some of your money, and tell me if you're going to spend more or less, right? <laughs> so what happens is if government is contracting and C is falling and interest rates are rising, does investment go up or down in that environment? It goes down as well. You see, a world where interest rates are rising, and when interest rates go up, the value of your bonds goes down. We're going to try that again. When interest rates go up, the value of your bonds goes down. And just so we're super clear, when interest rates go up, the value of your bonds goes down. Interest rates rising, the economy contracting, stock prices falling, real estate prices falling, unemployment rising. This needs to be in your base case scenario. If you do seven different stress tests, you should call this Tuesday. I call it Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That should not be a surprise to you. Most U.S. investors put 80 to 90% of their money in the United States of America in these U.S. stock and bond allocation programs. And they do it using backward-looking data. The past 30 years of interest rates going from high to low and inflation going from high to low, none of the macroeconomic trends of the past 30 years, government debt low to high, can repeat. It's a different-looking environment that we have going forward. At any given point, at any time on Earth, there are some assets that are cheap and some that are expensive. Debt is never good, and debt is never bad. All that debt is is a magnifier. If you make good investment decisions, they will be better. If you make bad investment decisions, you will destroy value. You see, if I was in an Argentinian 60-40, 50-50 stock and bond portfolio borrowing in Argentinian pesos when they went through crisis, I'm probably bankrupt. If I borrowed an Argentinian pesos and bought anything on earth, and then the currency devalued and I moved it back, I'm the richest person in Argentina, okay? 
It is not ever that debt is good or bad, but this is one of the most difficult times in the history of Earth to deploy capital. And so you cannot have the debt side of the balance sheet be managed without the financial advisor working together. You have to get this right, and you have to get it right now. I sincerely get so excited when I think about this organization's opportunity looking forward. There are so many robo-advisors. There are so many asset allocation models that are out there. Schwab's are free and Fidelity and everything else. I don't think you can compete on my 60-40 asset allocation model is worth you paying me 1%. I, I don't understand this story. But I do know that there is a huge, huge group of people that are feeling behind and undersaved for retirement. They're feeling like they want to do more. They're feeling like they need to do more to help out their kids, to help out their parents. They are pretty risk averse, but they have pretty aggressive goals. And when you're trying to balance that delicate demographic and you have millions of households as a firm, the power of a financial advisor and banker working together to deliver integrated, comprehensive, and holistic wealth management has never been better. People want personal CFOs. You're in the best position to be that role. Thank you.